Hello and welcome everyone. Uh, yes, the traditional five minutes of waiting for everyone to pitch up has, uh, has started. Um, we will begin at five past. See you then. Okay, ladies and gentlemen. Right, if I can turn your eyes towards the monitor and uh, please behold, I go and do control. We control the horizontal. We control the vertical. Uh, apparently, I don't control my password. Right. Anyway, so let's start. Let's start off over here and get going again. Now, I did say yesterday I would have some. Apparently, I've forgotten how to type. There we go. Okay. Uh, apparently, uh, apparently there are some uh, things that uh, there are some things that we really do need to discuss this morning. First off, being the exams that we were going to do tomorrow. Um, sadly, the uh, there does appear to be some issues with our website and the way that it is working at the moment. So um, I have looked at, I've looked into it, and it does not look like we will be writing tomorrow. Um, that's uh, that is an issue. That is an issue. I would recommend that you please write as soon as possible. If there is enough, um, if there is enough interest, I will organise a separate session where we can go sit down and we can actually where we can write it together. Um, if that if that is what you want, uh, otherwise feel free to write it by yourselves. That's uh, you should you should have a reasonable idea. Or you should have a pretty good chance of actually getting through. A better than a reasonable chance actually. So with that, let's go and continue on. Um, by the way, uh, just first off, before we continue on, uh, uh, can everyone see my screen? Uh, hands up if you can see my screen, please. Thank you, Kirsty. And nobody else. Mm. Okay. Well, Kirsty, today, uh, Kirsty, at least uh, at, at least you'll be up to date on everything that uh, goes on here. So, thanks. I'm just going to put your hand down. Let us continue. So, now yesterday we actually got through most of uh, a lot of the actual setups about the system. Now, the system itself, as you can guess, it's a full system. It's not a, uh, it, it's it's not sort of a little add-on or a little, oh, it's just a little POS system on the side. No. The entire idea with iVend is that it is actually a full system. Please do not make, uh, oh, there we go. Carla can see me too. That's great. Um, please do not make the mistake of um, uh, of thinking that iVend is just a little add-on to a system, or it's just it's just a little thing that sits on the side that you know it just kind of does some uh, that just kind of does some bits and pieces. Um, right, the big thing uh, that does some bits and pieces and integrates through to an ERP, it does more. Ivent does much, much more, as, uh, as I think you're beginning to see. And retail is not just, oh, it's it's just a little thing. It's a couple of processes. It's easy. No, please do not make that mistake. If you're an ERP consultant, that's the worst mistake you can make. Um, it is not just a little, uh, it's, it's not just a, a little bit, it's not just a little thing. Um, it's not just a little bit on the side. Please realize there is much more to it. Okay, so we covered authorization yesterday, and I um, we are not really going to go too much into POS customization. I, I realize I have skipped IT administration. I am coming back to it. Um, but I am just going to go show you that you can go open it up. You can see here is where it is. You can also, I'm also going to tell you you can go online, and you can go do your bits and pieces that you need to find out how to change things there. Um, yes, this entire front end that I have been using is built in uh, is built in here it is a configuration it is not a um, it's just a configuration it is not a actual uh, it's not a program it's not a programming thing you need to do there's I know with some of the others they say yes it's a fully customizable front end uh, meanwhile yeah it it's fully customizable if you know XML or something like that um, it's not like that with us. This is actually it is actually a full fully customizable thing. You can you can go drag and drop certain things. Um, I will recommend that. Oh, yeah, no, I think we're already doing that. I will recommend go online, look at the videos. They are actually pretty comprehensive. That's why we have the that. To be very honest, that is why we have the videos. Is um, look, 
we can't cover everything while we're here. The videos are there. And particularly, uh, the other nice thing about the videos is uh, if you just want to brush up on something, you know, that's a nice thing about a video. You don't have to listen to me going on and on and on about, a, about something that happened to me one time while I was uh, in Tanzania, uh, Tanzania or wherever it is. Uh, you can actually just go, oh, yeah, that, that story, yeah, no, that, that was boring, and we can, we can just skip that. Um, and once again, I do want to point out, guys, uh, any questions, please put them in the question box. I will answer as soon as possible. Now, back to IT administration that I said I was going to skip, but I have now come back to. Um, there are a few things over here that you do need to be aware of. Uh, please just, yeah, be, be aware about how, things are all set, uh, about how things are set up. First off is the replication monitor. Now, just to explain, back to my favorite slide, integration is from the enterprise server to the uh, ERP between these two. Between enterprise server and the store and the store and the enterprise is replication because they're essentially a same, well, very similar, if not the same database that is moving backwards and forwards between here, uh, between the two spots. So you just need to, so please be aware of that. Um, because it's one of the problems we do find when we are diagnosed when I'm diagnosing issues specifically with first time ERP with first time guys who are used to going and dealing with just the ERP side is they normally say the stores are not integrating to the enterprise at which point I say what but the stores don't integrate to the enterprise you know the it is it the integration between here and here or is it the replication between here and here. And if you get the wrong one, then it's a uh, then that's a problem. So just please be aware of that. Um, replication is basically it's going to say what gets sent, where it gets sent. You do have drill downs on the side. You can actually drill down into it and see what is being sent there. Um, and it'll tell you if it's an ad, it's an update, or whatever it is. Obviously, I do not have extra stores set up on the system because this is the demo stack and it does demos. Yeah, so that over the, so that just means that a lot of the stuff for replication just gets piled up. Um, there is also the replication monitor to mobile devices. Please remember with the mobile devices that goes from store to mobile device or enterprise to mobile device, depending on your setup. And the mobile device does have a small SQL Lite database on it. It is a small database, guys. It's not a. This is not a full on. It's, how can I describe it? It's not even a full uh, SQL Express database. A SQL Express database is basically just a cut down version of Microsoft SQL, which is a proper database. And you can take your SQL Express database and restore it onto a full on SQL server and it will work fine as a full on SQL, as a full on SQL database. There's no problem with it. Heck with it, you can take a large database and run it on SQL Express provided it falls under certain restrictions, you'll be fine. A SQLite database is something entirely different. Now, a bit of interesting backstory on it, SQLite was actually developed by the US, uh, US military for use in their guidance in their uh, guidance systems for their missiles. So it is very small, it does, it does work, and it was built by the military. So it does kind of do what it needs to do. And I guess they mostly hit what they were uh, they mostly hit what they were aiming for in the last couple of wars. So it's not all that bad. Fortunately, we have turned this power to good, and now you can use it to go sell things and stores. Um, yes, and it is fully encrypted, and it does fall under all of the bits and pieces that uh, all of the things that you do need to set up there. Now, back to over here. Obviously, uh, the reason we do have these is you do need to know whether things are going and moving. If they are not moving, then nine times out of ten, because this is going between uh, between IVend instances, uh, nine times out of ten, in fact, ninety nine times out of a hundred, it's going to be a problem with your firewall or something like that that is going and either blocking communication this way or blocking communication this way. And you can get communication coming in, but no communication not going out. That's also a firewall thing because that can be the firewall on this side or on this side, or it's just not allowed the rule. Or you've had an update to your antivirus and it's now decided it doesn't like you, it doesn't like you anymore. These are all options and possibilities. Now, 
on to the next one. Right. Uh, next one up is the integration monitor. Now, depending on what, um, uh, sorry guys, I just need to respond to this. All right, so the integration monitor over here, depending on your integration that you're using, you might have different inter this integration monitor in different places. That, for instance, Ivent e-commerce is in the, I, this is the Ivent e-commerce integration. The QuickBooks integration is up here, and it will not actually look like this. This is a slightly older version. We've refreshed it since then. Um, but uh, the integration monitor over here is also uh, the integration monitor you can use over here. Most of our ones look very similar to this. The, fortunately, this is something you don't really need to go and uh, you don't really need to check in too often for. Well, you do need to check it, but the major point you'll probably be looking at is the integration failure monitor. And the nice thing is, is that you can then show a complete error message um, right, of how it all goes and fits through over here of uh, exactly what the error message is and that's a nice thing it does show the complete error message it doesn't just go say x message object reference slot set to instance of an object which yeah in this particular case it will actually give you the full error message of what's actually going wrong there so yeah that's also things that have happened um right so after that uh you can also go to enable offline store once again, as, like I said, with most of the offline store stuff, that is, don't use it in 6.56. We'll bring out 6.6, .6, that has got new versions of that. That will change on how uh, that will change on how things work. Please remember that this offline store functionality, you do not need to do that in order for the store to actually function offline. It does that anyway, even if the internet goes down. That is standard setup in iVend. It is not a... Um, uh, it, it's not something you need to worry about. It's not something you need to enable. The offline store functionality, the entire idea for it was if the LAN actually went down. So, for instance, if that actually went down and the stores couldn't connect to the store server app. Um, you don't need to worry about it. You will not be tested on it. And as well, in the next version, we will be enabling it properly. Next one is the database backup. Now, Please, for the love of all that is wonderful and good in this world, please do not think that this is the place where you take your normal database backup for your um, that you take your normal database backup for your uh, actual uh, for your normal enterprise uh, SQL backup for your uh, for your enterprise for your stores or whatever it is. This is not for that. Okay, if you're gonna take your normal backup, your normal media backup that you should be doing pretty much every day for for head office and definitely pretty much, well, almost every day for the stores, definitely. Um, this backup, sh uh, that's the one that you would do through your SQL setup. And that one over there should actually be, um, that one you do through normal SQL or whatever backup media you're using. This backup over here is to initialize the store database. Now, to explain what I mean by that is, to initialize the store database, we go and we take a, basically a cut down backup of the enterprise server here. You take that across to the store and then on your, uh, I don't have it running at the moment, but you right click on your, uh, on your connection manager and one of the options is database restore. Uh, or a store, store, uh, store database. When you do that, it will go and set up the store server over here. And the reason that we don't just say, oh, connect it across to this point and then it automatically synchronizes everything through, it's actually taking things like the encryption keys that you need from the enterprise server across to here, as well as a, uh, as well as a rather large chunk of data. It means that you don't need to re synchronize everything that's everything from enterprise to here and that's going to take over many hours and eat up all your bandwidth instead what's going to happen is it's now going to go and take um, instead what's uh, what's going to happen is now going to just uh, synchronize the changes so that will just synchronize back across and then you should be fine but 
next, uh, but that's something else that you that uh, but that's something that you can work with, um, that you can work with over here. But please, once again, please note this is not your normal MS SQL backup. This is just to go and initialize the store. All right. Uh, same thing over here for the mobile database backup. It's to initialize your mobile database. Okay, so you take your, your mobile database, because what's going to happen is to initialize this one, um, you can go and take a backup from here and you can transfer it across and initialize the small SQL-like database over there. And once that's initialized, it will then go and be able to trade over here. The difference is with the mobile pods is you can actually initialize that one over the air because it is in a secure environment generally. After that, we get the add-on manager. And as you can see over here, I am running a QuickBook integration add-on. You can run additional add-ons in iVent. Um, I have been saying this throughout, but you can go run those. You can generate your own ones. You can create your own ones. You can load them up. You can use them to expand iVent functionality. You can use it to contract for iVent functionality. There are certain limitations in it. There are certain screens that you can't access uh, because we haven't enabled uh, the extensibility on them. And there are certain things that you cannot change in the way that we work because that's pretty much mandatory about the way that things do work. But for instance, if I did want to, say, change the way that we scan things at the point of sale here, um, I can do that as well. I can do that as well. Or how things load up on the line, I can do that here as well. All right, next one up is purge data. Oh, I love this one. Everyone freaks out about this one. Purging data? Oh my God, you've got, he's going to wreck the database. And then everything will stop working and then we're going to get support calls and then people will be angry and then they'll be yelling and no. No, 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 no. Now that I've established that, let me explain to you what data purge actually is. And you might have been listening earlier when I was talking briefly about SQL Express and the difference between SQL Express and SQL Lite. And also the difference between SQL Express and Big SQL, being SQL Pro or Enterprise or whatever version they're using now. The big difference with those ones is SQL Express and SQL Lite are limited databases. They're specifically limited in what you can and can't do with them. And not just that, you're also limited in certain things like resources. Now, your SQL Lite database, your SQL uh, Express database, sorry, SQL Lite. This applies as well, more or less. But your SQL Express database has got a size limit. Your SQL Express database cannot be larger than 9 gigs. Once it gets past 9 gigs, sorry for you. That's the end of it. But uh, having said that, you can actually still use quite a bit for 9 gigs. There's, there's a lot. Um, so there's a lot there. You can, you can run a store on it for a while. But the problem is that after a while, even at a store, you're going to start building up additional, you're going to start building up a lot of data. This is going to be things like transactions. This is going to be things like, um, uh, this is going to be things like uh, your transactions. It's going to be things like your different, uh, the different setups uh, uh, that are over there that are maybe things that are no longer used. Um, yeah, uh, a lot of the history, to, uh, a lot of history that may no longer need to be kept. Um, that kind of stuff is going to build up, and it does, trust me, specifically on things like history. History goes and marks every single change you make to the database. So effectively, it can double the size of a database easily. Now, having said, uh, obviously, after a while, that's going to just make a huge, huge log file. It's going to make the machine crawl. Uh, crawl. You want to go and have something to manage the size of the, of the database, and that's where the data purge comes in. And please realize the data purge only affects the store server app and the mobile pods. It does not affect the enterprise server. The enterprise server you do not do data purge on, specifically because your enterprise server should have a full SQL license. It's, you should not be running SQL, uh, SQL Express at your enterprise server. If you are, you are a very small store. If you are not a very small store and you are still doing it, it's going to run really slow. And then it's going to stop. So. Short answer, don't do it. Back over here at the store where the purge will take place. And uh, 
what you will go what you do is you go and you set the date clear purge transactions data before whatever it might uh, a certain date clear the inventory logs and clear the uh, clear the audit log that over there can cut the size of a database down I, in fact the one I did it on I saw it took a database from about nine gigs to about two because of all of the extra data that was in there and well, actually it was about eight gigs to two but still doesn't matter it still wouldn't chop down a database from a huge hunky pile of uh, from a huge thing that could barely that could barely run and function because of SQL Express's limitations to something that was actually once again pretty quick and nimble typically you should run the data purge about every six months um, if not sooner you can run it on a monthly basis if you want to but it will just take out that information that is no longer needed at the store database here Having said that, because the next question I get on this is, but Keith, what happens if it's six months later and or uh, whenever or 12 months later and somebody comes back with a warranty claim? Well, will you not be able to go search for the transaction in the local store database? Well, yeah, you won't be able to find a local store database, but with iVend, we have thought of that because if it can't find it over here, you'll remember that one of the settings in Enterprise, if it can't find something here, it then searches the enterprise server so you will always have access to that old data it's essentially what it is doing this essentially what the purge is doing is it's clearing out duplications okay it will not clear out something that hasn't integrated if you have a transaction for love of everything if you have a transaction over here or over here that is not integrated it will not purge it once it's integrated and it falls within the parameters you set, then it will purge it. But it will never, there's always a backup with the pur with this purge. And no, I'm not going to make comments about terrible movie series either. Um, after that, we have the API health check, which is one of your main tools in figuring out, does your is your API actually working? So if I go and I type in, say, my loopback address here, Okay, I can do my full address if I want to, but typically you use this to just check, is your API actually up and running? Because that's one of the first things that happens when you're trying to connect through between two computers is you say, hey, I'm trying to connect through to this computer and it doesn't work for whatever reason. Why does it not work? Well, is the API running? Once you verify that the API is running, or not as it might be in my case, then you can go say, okay, well, the API, it says the API is running over here on the specific, uh, on the specific machine. And there we go. API, I an mean, API is accessible. Everything is there. It's working. It's running. It's good to go. Right there, which means that the problem is, which means that instantly the problem is probably a network problem. Of course, if it's not running, then it's going to be something with the IIS probably, at which point you need to go find out why it's not running. But that's something uh, that's an entirely different uh, set of diagnosis you need to do. So it actually cuts down pretty much half of the diagnosis you need to do on for the API. Because if the API is, is running, then and an outside machine can't connect, then it's a network issue. If the API is not running, well, then it's an IIS problem, and you need to fix that. And then once you fix that, then you can go uh, once you fix that and test this correct, and the outside machine still doesn't connect. Well, then it's also a network problem. It's a network problem in that case too. But uh, for the first thing you need to do, you can at least check that one half of the problem is wor is is working, which is the IIS and or your API. Once that's up and running, you can then go say, okay, Mr. Networking Guy, fix it. And yes, right there, because that's the favorite thing that that's the favorite thing I've seen from a lot of hardware guys. You go and you say, I can't I can't talk to this. Oh well, everything's configured. Yes, it, it must be your software. It's your software, not mine. No, my, everything's fine with mine. It's, it's not my software, it's yours. And then you can go say, no, but I can test it over here. My software says it's working. And then they say, hmm. Okay, it might be my software. At which point they, uh, at which point they will never admit that. They will actually just go, mm, well, let me check something. And then it, uh, then it will eventually work. Okay, auto upgrade connection check. Um, we've got, two ways to upgrade iBend, one of which is to go and you can do an over-the-air upgrade, which is basically 
you will connect from the enterprise, uh, you will connect from Ivan Enterprise to our servers in yeah, India at the moment, I think. And then it will pull down the upgrade, it will load it up, and it will run it over here. The other way you can do it is you can simply download the new version of Ivan and run the install, at which, at which point it will run the upgrade. Um, most people I see just want to download and run the install. It's easier. And you can control it. But if you do want to do automatic uh, auto server upgrade, uh, you can do that as well. You can do this as well. This just checks whether you can actually connect. Uh, license information. Ah, now this screen is actually kind of important because there is one point in here that I find people consistently get things wrong. And that is with the management console user license assignment. As you can see over here, I have assigned a license to a user. I've also assigned a license to a, to a PC. And you can do this with a management console. And this is something that we found is that a lot of what ha would happen with a lot of people is they would go and assign, they, uh, they would go and multiply, uh, they would assign the same, they would assign two licenses to a person who is using a PC. So essentially, I've got two people here using the same PC where I, can, where I would only need one license. So if I've got a license on the PC, then anybody with a login, a valid login, can log in and use that, that license on the PC. Otherwise, I can assign the license to the user, which means that user can use any management console with a valid management console setup. So over here, so over here you can decide, do I want to give it to, my, to the user? Well, over here you can see, has it been assigned to the user or has it been assigned to the, uh, to the management console? Or has it been assigned to the user or to the machine? And you can say, aha, I can stop double assigning licenses where I don't need to, which will free up a lot of your licenses. And also make sure that they're not all just eaten up by needlessly double assigning stuff. The EULA, if you want to read it, it's here. I've had some people to do that. Yep, you can copy and paste, have fun. System information, this over here will give you your, as soon as it runs through, uh, similarly to the pause, it'll give you all the information that's actually running and all the um, DLLs and whatever else is loaded, or whatever else is needed to be loaded up for all of your, um, uh, for all of the things that are, well, that are running in SQL here, in iVent here. And you can see what's there. You might need to copy this and send it across to support. That's something else you can do. Um, after that, we've got the audit log master where you can control what is being audited. Now, some of these things, uh, to be very honest, some of these things will probably never change. You don't really need to go and keep an audit log on everything. Um, it can just lead to things just accumulating. Um, you can, so, but however, I would always recommend uh, keep, uh, for instance, customer master. Keep an eye on that one. That's a favorite one for fraud. Uh, product master as well is a favorite one. Oh, I'll just rename this product to be a uh, yes. Uh, so, actually, I actually we actually had this. I had this in uh, in one of my sites where somebody had renamed like a. Uh, what was it? it was an electronic shop and they re renamed a remote control from a remote control to a PlayStation 4 so it went from like a normal little TV remote or replacement remote to a, to a PlayStation 4 and apparently they've been selling they apparently sold a couple of these things it was their own private little item that because the uh, the actual item the um, the the what's this, uh, the actual item the TV remote was like 150 bucks or 200 bucks and um, it but it was an item that was no longer stocked it was actually meant to be deactivated what this guy had done is he'd reactivated it renamed the item and then when he received the play when he received playstations in he'd receive them in under that item code and then he'd sell them and then he'd quietly sell them off on the side so technically everything looked legit it was just called a different uh, it was just called a different name so and called a different name, and because it, he didn't have access to the pricing, and he couldn't change the price, um, or well, had he changed the price, we would have caught, it would have been caught much sooner. But uh, that is something to be aware of. 
anyway, it was one of the things that, once again, we caught with Ivend because we put in this and he tried the same thing. And then all of a sudden it was like, hey, there's a lot of sales of this little, of this thing over here. What the hell is this? Why have we got two PlayStation 4 things here? So definitely things like that. However, things such as states and surcharges, well, state surcharges, yeah, it's up to you, really. It depends exactly what you want to keep logging on. But once you've got the logging going, you can then go select and see exactly what is uh, uh, what has changed. So I'm just going to do a search on the customer records. And you can actually go for specific record IDs for specific audit keys if you want, or specific uh, customer codes. You can see what happened to them. Um, you can also export them, and you can clear the history. So, for instance, if there is just history clogging the system, um, you can clear it. Once again, this all depends on if you've got rights. If you do not have rights, it does not happen. So, but you'll be able to go see what changed at certain points and what was added and what was removed and how that exactly worked over here. After that, yeah, okay, we've got registered application. You can register some additional applications to be to go work with iVend, or that can go pull certain things off. You can then monitor what's actually going and being uh, what's being sent. Um, and then also some application patches if you do need to go put some patches through. Uh, we are actually trying to go do patches that will go and um, uh, that that you can then go run. Uh, and these patches will be coming out monthly, so you can actually go. Uh, so it's a collection of if we found any bugs for that month, we put a, put together a patch. You can load up the patch, and then it goes and it runs. Once it runs. Well, then you can go and be rest, rest secured that it will go and hopefully fix those errors that have popped up. Whether it creates new errors, yeah, no, I will. I, I will say nothing on. I will say nothing more. All right, and that takes us. That is the end of the administration module. Yes, it is the longest module, but now I expect things to go a bit quicker because I'm hoping you guys actually know things like the customer side, like customers and business partners. So I'm not going to need to spend too much time here. Um, too much through here and we can hopefully get through this relatively quickly. So to start off with we're going to go with customers which I'd imagine uh, most people should be fairly familiar with. I mean it's a, it's a customer list. If you're not familiar with it let me know in the questions and I will do a deep dive but for the moment I'm just going to go list off some of the features. So for instance you have a drill down up here where you can drill down into one of our dashboards. Uh, and you can edit this dashboard. This dashboard is entirely editable in the reports view. And you can go set up exactly how these different uh, how these uh, different widgets work. These widgets you can even apply timers to. So remember in, uh, I think I actually mentioned this before, remember in my path to purchase, which we talked about on Monday, um, where you can go see once at the store, the store associate recognizes you and brings you your jeans. That would be facilitated by a screen like this. Okay. From here, first name, last name. Yeah, I'm not going to go through all these. Like I said, can you order items or not? Gender. Well, with all the modern stuff today, you can actually go and the nice thing is uh, you can type here. Okay, so we can accommodate Facebook's all 57 million or whatever the hell they've developed these days. I don't know. Um, anyway, you can you can type in there, so that's fine. Yes, we're so far ahead of this. Next up, date of birth. Uh, you can load that in. All right, so simple drop down, and you can put in the date of birth over there. Same thing for anniversary date. Uh, date of birth and anniversary date are actually quite important because. Um, we use them a bit further later for our promotions. Mobile phone, phone number, alternate phone number. You've seen that I can go change, uh, I can make the fields mandatory, I can also change captions, I can change layouts. All that can be changed. So the important thing for that is, is that the person at the front desk here, right, if they need to see something, they don't see, they don't need to see everything, they just see exactly what they need to see. Um, that way they don't end up going and getting distracted by other data or telling people about stuff or whatever the case might be. They will only see what they need to see. They do not need to see everything that happens. There you go. So fax numbers, emails, uh, 
yeah, I even put one in here for Facebook address, but I suspect I changed the caption on it. Yeah, it was web page, but you know, that's the nice thing. You can change the caption and change it to Facebook address or um, a Facebook page or whatever that might be, whatever the hip cool kids are using these days. Uh, after that, you can also load up as many co uh, contacts as you want. Um, really, there is a button down here for it. You can go and load them up. And once again, once you go in there to edit it, you can also set titles, salutations, first name, last name, nicknames, phone numbers, mobile phones, uh, faxes, pages, which are apparently still a thing. Yep. Um, emails, extra comments, more genders, professions, date of birth, city of birth, country of birth. So, yes. There is a lot you can load up here, um, and it does. I know it does look very much like CRM, but what it is actually is loyalty. Loyalty and CRM look and smell fairly similar in some areas. So just just be aware of that. It's um, we are a retail management system. We are not a CRM. Okay, right there, let me repeat again. We are not a CRM. We are a retail management system. If you want to go and check things like when people visited clients at what time, at what date, and did they put an activity in the system to go say that they uh, they saw the client and this happened at this time, and you can then do it through geolocations, all the rest of it, use Salesforce. Um, there are other ways. <laughs> there are other ways. There are other things that uh, uh, there are other ways and other programs to go track things like that. For us, we're retail. We don't necessarily track that stuff. Um, and on that note, we come down to loyalty. Are they a loyalty member or not? Uh, do they get loyalty notifications? Which loyalty program do they uh, do they have? Uh, do they get pass notifications? Yeah, that should actually be checked. Yes. Uh, do you? Um, we'll come more to loyalty a bit later when we do that section. But do they refer loyalty? Uh, were they? Did somebody refer them to the loyalty program? Um, and I'll chat more about that later. Uh, what is their ship? Uh, do they have a specific shipping type they use? Is there a discount that they have? What is the marketing? Do they and is GDPR? Uh, GDPR is General Data Protection Regulation. Now, this is uh, it's not something that really encroaches into the ERP space. It is something that is very much a thing in the retail space. Recently, in the EU, they passed the GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulations. Which effectively means that you can go and tell a company like Google to completely forget your data. Yeah, they can do that because it is your data. You can you own it. Um, the understanding with Google at the moment and where they make their money is they are store uh, you are storing your data with them, and the fee essentially for storing it with them is they get to, is they get to look at it and give you creepy ads. That's what they do. Um, but with GDPR, and it's not just in the EU, it is also in the US. It is also, I know South Africa is going contemplating this. I know many countries worldwide are contemplating this because, quite frankly, Google and Facebook and Twitter and a lot of these other places have gotten a little bit creepy about the way that they do things. And, of course, having said that, the other problem is is that most of your data is probably in China anyway because they go and they use because uh, most places use Huawei and uh, Huawei and ZTE communication stuff and I can guarantee you most of that data has uh, quietly gone back to China and people are looking at at, at it there anyway but besides from that uh, I can, I'm pretty sure that uh, I'm pretty sure that one day China is going to get bored of that and well we'll see what happens there but for the moment, you can tell places like you in Europe, you can tell them to go forget you. In the US, you can do it as well, as well as certainly other places out here in Africa. Addresses. You can have as many addresses as you want. Mm -hmm. Yep. You can have a billing address and a shipping address. Now, the billing address is where you send the bills to. So this could be like a PO box, whereas the shipping address is where you actually ship the stuff to. So that's generally a physical location. Um, you can have a default address that you set here. That's entirely up to you. If I go over here, you can create your own default address with GPS numbers and street numbers and sales and tax codes and states and zip codes and all these wonderful things that you might want. Um, and you can set that there, and then it will be loaded up, and you can see it. Loyalty, I said I'd get you later. I do want to point out, and I did mention user-defined fields, I think it was on Tuesday, where you go and set your um, the user-defined fields over here, 
Uh, you can go set up as many of them as you want. Really, it's quite nice. You can actually have as many as you want, and generally they will integrate across to the ERP system. Um, once again, please check your ERP documentation to go see exactly how far they integrate across. Not all of them do. For instance, QuickBooks does not, primarily because QuickBooks is tiny. And uh, yeah, it, Quick, QuickBooks, you don't really need to have them integrate across. It's easier just to keep them alive. And, but uh, that is something you can do there. You can also load up comments. And so if you can go and put a comment over there, and you can go right into it and say exactly who the person is. Um, you might not think that that's something that's important at the moment, but we do actually have a chain of uh, wellness centers or spas in the, you know, foot spas. You go there for a massage. And they actually load comments about what the customers like into, uh, into their profiles, so they will have it ready when the customer arrives. Um, subsidiary accounts, if there are, uh, this is part of my subsidiary functionality. You can look. In iVend, because we can operate in a standalone situation, we can actually go and keep track of things like credit limits, balances, order balances, layaway, all the rest of it. However, when we are in, in, in an integrated environment, we don't, because that we would rather mirror it from the accounting system, because the accounting system is going to handle things such as uh, 30 payments in 30 days, account payments, things like that. That's other things we're not really worried about, that we don't really want to keep an eye on. But you can keep an eye on it here, in, that's something you can, we will replicate across, you will be able to see here. So somebody who is over their credit limit will not be able to buy. Um, but for the most part, this account details, uh, this, uh, this account details and how that's set up, um, yeah, that that's uh, most of it's normally controlled through the ERP, unless it isn't because you're not plugged in. Um, Contacts we covered, loyalty points we'll come back to later, so we'll be with referred members. And that's your customers, pretty straightforward. Same thing over here with customer groups. Uh, one thing I do want to point out about customer groups is there is actually a discounts button which you can set inside your customer group. And the discount button over here will allow you to go set up different, way, uh, different stores with different dates and times and what sort of discounts they can add. For that specific group, but and that applies to all items that that customer buys, but that that customer group buys. Uh, there is also uh, I'm, one other thing I do want to point out about the customers here, and there is a reason I'm coming back. Please remember that there's a batch of uh, of fields over here that I haven't actually been through, like active and on hold and home currency and store and all these things. There's a batch of these things that you can actually pull into here that um, I would really recommend that you go and you have a look at. Uh, just because it isn't immediately available up front here does not mean that there is no field for it. There might already be a field for it. You it just might not immediately show. Right. Customer catalog, uh, I actually don't really see this happen too much these days, but um, this happens more in a wholesale environment. So effectively what's happening over here is your customer catalog, you're going and saying, uh, oh, come on, and there we go. With it, you are essentially going and saying that uh, your customer might order something from you with a different code name. So, for instance, I might call this a 100102, uh, but they might call it a, there you go, 12345789 with a different description. Yeah. This typically, like I said, it typically happens in wholesale, more in wholesaling environments than in um, more in wholesaling than in retail environments. Very rarely in retail will the guy say, yo, I need a, I need a this. And you're going to say, uh, what the heck is that? And they're going, to go, they're going to know your part number. They're not going to know the other part. Uh, they're not going to know other things. Um, though this is very handy if you're dealing with things in the automotive world. Because what we have found is that in the automotive world, people do all use their own part numbers. So... A headlight can be a one, two, three for, for one partner. It, for one supplier, it can be an X, Y, Z for another partner. It can be something completely different for a third partner. And it's all exactly the same part. Yeah. Right there. It's exactly the same part, slightly different branding, but it does exactly the same thing. 
joy. Lastly, we've on the customer front, we have customer printing. Now, this is actually quite nice. You can, with this, you can actually say for a customer or a customer group. Um, you can go say, uh, you can go say over here, uh, pensioners discount. There you go, pensions discount on Tuesday. And you can have that print out on the bottom of the slip. Um, so the guy, so presumably if they're reading it, they can actually see, see it's there. Uh, same thing, and you can assign that to a customer group. Um, and you can say what, the, what exactly you're putting there, so which customer group it is. That's quite nice. You can put that there for them. It's just some way to go let people know what's, what's happening for that. Uh, the much more useful one that we'll get to in a minute is for items. So, uh, then we get to vendors. Now, iVend itself over here, yes, you can purchase things through, um, you can purchase things through iVend. Um, we do actually have uh, your different uh, business transactions, your purchase orders, goods receipts, just normal goods receipts. Um, we do have those in the system itself. But you don't, uh, to, uh, how can I put this? Uh, typically with us, you're going to do your first two steps, which is your purchase order and your goods receipt. No, we don't do purchase requests. That is one thing we don't do. Um, Quite specifically, we don't do purchase requests because, yeah, typically that ends up being an email to someone. Um, and purchase requisitions, that's typically something that's maybe a bit larger or for some of your larger companies. And we really don't see, well, we haven't had the call for it. I'll put it that way. Um, occasionally people do ask, but that's not really something that we end up looking at much. Um, now, once again, I have an extensibility if you really want to go down that route. So the vendors over here are pretty cut down. There's not a lot that really goes on them. I mean, it's the same billing address, shipping address, uh, comments, uh, functionality that's here. In fact, most of the functionality that you see is in common with the customer side. Uh, you can also associate products with them. So which products do they supply? Um, that just helps with when you're searching for things. Uh, you can, if, if you're searching to purchase stuff, you can say, aha, these products are generally purchased by, from Ruben Schmidt. And you can also have different uh, different account details, and you can see what uh, price list and uh, if, uh, and what their purchase tax codes are, and that's associated with the subsidiary. Otherwise, that would be available over here in the general screen as well. Vendor groups. It's a thing. Yes. Vendor catalogs, which works pretty much the same way as a uh, pretty much the same way as the custom catalog would work. Um, this is slightly more useful, particularly like I gave my earlier suggestion of the automotive industry where you've got, um, ah yes, that's the one, that's where it happens a lot, and is your uh, bearings, with it. so your car bearings or your clutches. Because typically you get a, you get, uh, you get a branded one, so that'll be like a VW, bear, a VW uh, clutch or VW bearing or whatever it is that's specifically um, uh, specifically made for that for that car uh, that's specifically branded by VW for that and that's going to cost like five times what a normal generic off-market one will cost that's probably exactly the same product it's just not branded as VW so yeah so on the vendor catalog side it is actually quite handy because then you can print it you can print out a purchase order to that specific vendor that uses their own item numbers that people will then recognize and say hey okay is this how this works uh, okay is this what you need that's fine instead of them having to go try to figure out what your numbers are and how they map to their numbers and confusion and yeah let's let's avoid that so that's the vendor catalog number side i will say is quite nice and that's business partners Surprise. Next up, inventory, which does have a couple more screens in it. In fact, quite a few more screens in it. So let's hurry up and get through it. Now, products, products are products, guys. I mean, I'm not, I don't want to spend too much time on it. Well, there you go. You can see my pictures. Once again, we have the drill down over here. That's associated with it. You can see it. There it is. Drill down into it successfully. Right. So there's my different uh, product sales all the rest, uh, product sales, all the rest of it, how this one is doing. That's quite nice. Descriptions, long descriptions, short descriptions, 
costing. Guys, typically with costing, um, if we are not plugged in to a, um, if we are not plugged into a uh, ERP system, then IVED can handle costing, and we can do it uh, two ways: either standard cost or average cost. Um, you can also uh, option not to have costing in IVED, but that's up to you. Um, you can also set a costing sub method. The costing sub method is: does it apply it overall to so? Does it apply it to all of the to all the stores, or does it only apply a certain costing to one store, and not to another store? That's up to you. Um, however, if we are plugged into an ERP, we will pull the costing from the ERP because that's got far more. It's once again we we don't really deal with finance because we don't really deal with finance. It's a, it's, how can I put it? Because we don't really deal with finance, we don't end up going and handling things like costing. We don't really end up doing things like journal entries and things like ERPs typically tend to handle that anyway. So we'd rather actually just let them do what they do well and let us do what we do well, which is retail. After that, we've got product groups and product classes that you can go put them in because obviously having just a product group is nice having product classes is having another product group is better and you've got to find out that when we do grouping and here's the product group we've we really have a lot of ways to do product grouping so let's have a look at apparel uh, typically it's just these top three uh, fields it's not these bottom three and here we go to discounts and you can also set discounts much the same way that you can do for customer groups so set up a discount for this product group in this time and that is where that fits in. Um, same thing with product classes. Product classes is, uh, let's go create a new one. You create a product class. So that's another way to go group products is product group, product class. And the nice thing about that is they also go and apply to your, uh, to your discounts. So you can create almost matrix type discounts with product groups and product classes. Right, we'll get to, to discounts a bit later. Unit or measure groups, um, guys, when this goes in, um, the entire thing for your um, for your unit or measure groups is this needs to be done the first time you create the item. If you create the item, if you want to go back and edit it, you can't actually do that. You'll see over here, I can't actually go put that in. Um, you need to do it the first time around. Now, certain... ERPs require an item group to be there in order for it to integrate. That's something else that we go. That we ch uh, that's something else that we've changed. Um, you can do that. Um, uh, you can you can actually have that set up in Ivan that it must. It's mandatory. You need an I, a UIM group, um, and you can go set that in the system as well, and have that integrate through. Use fractional quantity. Uh, yes, typically fruit and veg uses fractional quantities. So you're buying, and that's typically stuff you buy by weight. So is it a, if it's a weighed item or, um, no, well, you buy it by weight or by length, um, something like that. Uh, rolls of fabric, for instance, uh, I do know it can be sold by weight and they can also be sold by length. Do you, uh, these two checkboxes should always be checked, discounts allowed and allow sales discounts. If you do not have those two checked, you are not going to be able to do sales and you're going to be sitting there scratching your head, why can't I do sales? Right there. Uh, don't apply, uh, there you go. Don't apply sales discount on discounted items. So if something has a discount, I can't double discount it then. All right there, that's to stop that, otherwise I can. Uh, can you override the price? Does it have, and we'll get, does it have upsells? An upsell of a product is a, let me have a look over here, I think I've got one with, uh, is it this one? Uh, no, it's not that one. This one? Yeah, here we go. Okay, so this one over here is something I go and I see a lot with uh, your mobile phones. So for instance, I go, uh, for instance, when you're buying a phone, the, per, the, the person helping you will generally say, do you want to cover with that? Uh, do you want a screen protector, earphones, uh, earbuds, something like the uh, something like that? All those extra little bits and pieces that they sell on the walls. Um, to be honest, for most of those stores, 
uh, they don't actually make any money off selling you the phone. The, the phone is sold almost at cost because that's the price that's agreed with the network. Um, the place where those guys make money is off the covers, which are actually, you won't believe the amount of money that they make off that. But they make whole batch, so that's something else to be aware of. Uh, that's something else you can just keep an eye on here. Uh, next up, is, uh, and it will tell you over here, does it have an upsell associated with it or not? And does it have alternate products? An alternate product being a uh, one uh, being a substitute. So, for instance, over here on my examples, I have the Garmin, and this Garmin Nuvi. If I don't have any of this in stock, then it will suggest that I have a TomTom, which uh, that has got a match factor of about ninety-five percent. That match factor I can set to whatever I want. There is no super secret algorithm that secretly goes and looks at Amazon or whatever it is on the web and says, oh, this, this looks like it's about a, this is calculated to be a 95% match factor. And you people in white coats sitting around going and going, mm, yes, we agree with the algorithm. No. With this over here, it's you going and saying, yeah, Garmin Nuvi, TomTom, Tom, eh, they're about the same. That's it. So it's up to you about what you, what you want the match factor to be. You don't have to go and uh, you don't have to put on a white coat. So if it does help you with figuring out what the match factor is, then I would recommend putting it on. After that, we get to matrix items. Now we've talked about matrix items a bit, uh, a bit earlier. Now this is your uh, size color matrix. We'll come back to that a bit later and I'll show you an example. Is it batch tracked? Is it serial tracked? So yes, we do full serial and batch tracking. We can actually track, uh, and we can also do things like expiry dates. You'll see over here, do we require expiry dates for, um, for items? Uh, are you allowed to sell items that have expired? And uh, how do you automatically select serial or batch numbers? So for specific items, you can say this, this item, it just goes by expiry date. So it's going to assume that your expiry date is uh, the, the oldest, uh, the, uh, how can I put it? It's going to assume that the expiry date that is closest to expiring is going to be sold first. But no matter where it is. It doesn't matter what is actually being sold. It's just going to assume, well, that thing's got an expiry date of a week, as opposed to all the others, which might have two weeks. Um, lowest price first, so that'll track what the lowest priced item was, or the highest price, creation date, and if only one available, then it will automatically select it. Um, and yes, you can sell expired items. Having said that, that's kind of depends on your local legislation. Um, please note, and I do know this in, like, for instance, um, I do know in certain places what they do not allow selling expired items. Even though it's not technically expired, it's just over the expiry date. Because it's over the expiry date, they have to get rid of it. That's legislation in some places. In other places, it is not legislation. Please be aware of that. Uh, allow refund of expired items. Well, yeah, that's up to you if you want that, because if I bought something and I knew it was expired, I can't come back and say, oh, this is expired, I want a new one. Is it exchangeable or not? Um, you can do that, or is it refundable? Is it a non-stock item? Because you do get non-stock items that you can sell. For instance, you could maybe sell a voucher for a non-stock item, or that is just maybe installation or something, like, for instance, uh, satellite TV, uh, your DSTV. Right, is that, uh, is that an installation cost associated? Uh, refundable, how many days do you have to return it? Typically, I see over here, uh, typically you also have some legislation around this. I've seen out here in South Africa, I think it's, you have to give a return within 90 days. Um, once again, depends on what the item is. So, uh, typically the place you're implementing will know what their legislation is around that or what the company policy is. Is it saleable? Is it purchasable? If it's not, then you uncheck those and nobody can buy or sell it. Is it a weighed item? And yes, the weighed item over here works in conjunction with the allow fractional quantity. Like I said, weighed items are... Now, where's that disappeared to? Yeah, there it is. Weighed items. Once again, your weighed items are things like uh, nuts, fresh fruit and veg, meat, fish. Those kind of things are generally sold by weight. Allow EBT, um, yeah, your EBT, once again, is your electronic benefit, benefit transfer, and it's only used in the US. Otherwise, don't worry about it. As package group, and uh, what is the package group associated with it? 
Um, a package group over here, you see you can actually set up a package uh, and what this is, is it allows you to put an ID, description and a weight because specifically packages generally have specific sizes associated with them. So if you've seen those styrofoam packages, some of them or the um, clear plastic, plastic ones seem to be all the rage these days as opposed to styrofoam. Um, it typically what happens with those ones is they do actually have a bit of weight associated with them. And what will happen is if you're keeping track of those, um, Ivan will go say, okay, you've got uh, this item can be placed into certain, into this package group, and this package group will be like a 300 gram, 500 gram uh, kg size package. And depending on how much you're selling, we'll go into that package and you can then know how much packaging you've sold. As well as it can also go and deduct the packaging weight from the actual amount of food, is be well, food in this case is being sold, or whatever it might be. Um, uh, I also know that you can do it in t with uh, paint. Uh, in some places they do it with paint, um, where the tin might actually be a bit more expensive. But or, uh, the other one to do it with is beer. Once again, up to you. Kitting. So kits over here are, there we go, I've got a kitting item. A kit over here is, if you're familiar with, uh, with production, essentially what happens is when we integrate a kitting process through to a ERP, generally it's done through on the production side. But essentially what I'm doing over here is I'm making this item by using one of these and one of those. And I think I've actually explained kitting before. It's a, uh, generally, I, I think I gave the example of a camera or a games console. Um, the camera one's the one I normally use, where you get a, you get a camera starter kit. And then there you've got your, um, you've got your camera bag, you've got your, uh, your camera bag, lens, body, flash, uh, memory card, batteries, a tripod, that kind of stuff. That's all put together into a box. That's effectively a kit. You count it as one kit. But there may be, uh, may be times when you need to disassemble it and you go say, okay, well, actually, we're no, we're no longer selling this kit. We're going to take it apart. After that, assembly. Uh, is it an assembly bill of material or is it a, is it a dynamic assembly? Now, normally I'd recommend doing a, a dynamic assembly because you can change it. But an assembly bill of material is basically I've got these items all together for this type of, of kit and it happens spontaneously when you sell. If you don't know what assembly is, uh, let me know. I'll go back over it. Can you do layaways? Yes or no? Can you can you order it? Yes or no? What is the default quantity? Yeah, yeah you know, the default quantity, uh, maximum quantity per transaction, so only can buy, say, two per customer. Um, once again, the Apple iPhone examples spring to mind. What is your UPC code? Now, interestingly enough, the first thing that gets scanned over here at your point of sale is not the item code. The first thing it actually looks for is your UPC code here. So, yeah, uh, your UPC code generally being your barcode. Uh, same thing over here for your alternate UPC codes. So I can have, and the advantage with the alternate UPC codes is I can go and have multiple types of UPC code and this might have a quantity of one, but if I'm buying it from maybe a different place, this might also have a quantity of one. And uh, and to give you the example, the, the example I normally give on the multiple UPC codes is cans of Coke, because everyone's familiar with buying cans of Coke. And you'll see what actually happens if you buy a single can of Coke and if you buy a six-pack. A six-pack has actually got a different barcode on it than a... Um, so it wouldn't have pluses in it. So your barcode for your six pack um, would actually have a different barcode to your a barcode for a single item. And that means that you can actually apply specific uh, promotions and pricing to your six pack as opposed to having to go and do it for all of your items. Um, so that's something uh, that's something else to go and just consider uh, to consider about this as I've also seen that, um, sometimes when they get things from overseas, it'll be exactly the same item. In fact, I saw this with Pepsi. Um, at one stage in South Africa, they went and they bought in a whole batch of Pepsi from, I think it was Indonesia. And that had a different barcode to the Pepsi that was made locally. 
So, and something else to go consider. Require age verification. Alcohol, tobacco, firearms. Yeah, you pretty much require age verification. <laughs> okay, so you can actually set that, you can set a minimum age that people can uh, actually buy things at. Uh, alcohol and tobacco being the primary examples of those, though I would also imagine you could throw vapes and uh, certain medicinal marijuana under there as well. Manufacturer. Uh, no, well, yeah, that's your manufacturer. Your manufacturer does actually have some details to it as well. So if you open it up, they are, there is also the discounts that you can set from a specific manufacturer for a specific time for a specific date. You can do that here too. Uh, open price and allow zero price. So do you open the price and can you type it in? Allow zero price, you can sell it for nothing. Uh, open description, can you change the description in the pause? Uh, does it have zero value? which may indeed be the case. Some of these things do actually have, uh, some of them might be a zero value item because it is promotional. It got given to you by the manufacturers. The manufacturers actually have, um, the manufacturers will actually just give it away, it, 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 which means that it actually does have no value to you. Can you redeem loyalty points for it? And what is your product, uh, is there a product URL? If you are on a connect to online, you can do it through there. What is your barcode mask? And what is, uh, do you have any comments about the product? The comments are kind of nice because if there are specific instructions, you can put them in here for that. Um, you can also go say, uh, don't, don't buy, the, things like don't buy this product, it's uh, cheaply made and it's just not nice. Um, and then product price and margin. This is a actual function we've got where you can go and actually see what your current cost is on certain price lists and then adjust it to make sure that you've got the right price on the right price list and that you're making enough money on it. Images, you can load them up for the items as well as you can also set maximum and minimum discounts for here. And finally, your units of measure. Then we go across to inventory and I have been across to this a couple of times before. And remember guys, there's always in all of these, there's always additional more fields. I'm not going through all of them, but uh, yeah, there are a batch of them. The top section over here, is the, uh, here we go, a couple of questions could come through. Kwaku goes and asks, can you please clarify your example on use of UPC codes on packs of, codes on packs of cans, I'm guessing. Um, your UPC codes, uh, Kwaku, that's your, so you buy, uh, it's the difference between buying a can of Coke and buying a six pack of Coke. So your six pack of Coke, why should you not create them as separate products? Um, you don't necessarily want to go create, uh, the reason you don't necessarily want to go create a six pack of Coke as a separate product is because somebody can just, somebody can just rip it apart and then you've got six individual cans of Coke as opposed to a actual six pack of Coke. And you don't really want to take the time to go and unkit them or do something like that. It's, it's just a, a it's a, there's no reason go and add extra admin in just to do that as opposed to going and just having uh, just having alternate codes with different uh, different units of measure associated with them for that uh, uh, for that specific item so I hope that clarifies that because the the UPC code that's the thing with UPC codes is that that's the thing not just with UPC codes it's the thing with uh, with retail you are in there every day what if it comes out already packed from the factory? Well, that's the entire idea is that you will get your six pack coming out of the factory as a six pack. But typically, retailers do not buy single cans of Coke from Coca-Cola. Coke doesn't sell it to them like that. They sell it to them in pallets. So your pallet will have a different, will have a different uh, UPC code. Your six pack will have a different UPC code. Your case will have a different UPC code. Um, and because of the way retail is, and there's so much stuff moving around so quickly, uh, you don't really want to go spend time going and saying, oh, hang on, wait, now I need to go set up a production order to go manufacture and then go and unkit this item to go turn it from a case or from a case of Coke to a six pack and then from a six pack to a single can because we now need to put it into the front fridge. No, they're going to order, I want this many pallets of Coke done. Once they go, once it comes from the factory, 
okay, I've got, I want to come from the factory. Okay, I've ordered this many pallets of uh, this many pallets of coke from the from the distributor. The, uh, you, uh, the guy in the store goes and says, right, okay, I'm going to go and take. Uh, let's go take uh, a couple of these, and we're going to um, we're going to rip them open. Uh, you're going to rip open the plastic, and we're going to put the single cans into the fridges, into the, like the easy reach fridges at the front of the store. Or we put them into the fridges by where the cold drink section or whatever it is. They're not going to go and actually, they're not going to, a store owner does not want to go and add more admin to his life. The entire idea is this, is that it's going to be quick and easy. And that's the quickest and easiest there it is. You're not going to be going, to, you're not going to want to go and, oh no, I need to go run additional programs to go get things working. So I hope that uh, clears that up. Okay. The next, uh, uh, let's have a look. Okay. All right. So the next thing that we are just going to go and have a look at is, well, okay. So we just carry on here with the inventory view. Now you'll notice over here that if I go to select different uh, warehouses, this bottom section appears and disappears. So to explain the top section, I'm going to select a warehouse that does not have a bottom section. And you'll see that those are the locations. So I'm going to select the New Jersey warehouse here. And you'll see, oh, by the way, this little arrow button here, that minimizes that inventory, that it minimizes the menu here. Um, this over here, you can go see the code, the name, subsidiary, transaction type. So can you buy and sell things at the specific store? Um, purchase tax code, sales tax code, uh, product cost, price, lead time. Um, yeah, you can read all of these. Uh, once again, you don't necessarily want everyone to see all of this, your cashiers, you don't really want to go see the product cost. There's no reason they need to see product cost, to, to be very honest, because you know what's going to happen then as they said, oh, you're making so much money off of this. Ooh, I don't feel so bad about stealing from you. Hmm. Yeah, let's avoid that situation. Um, we can also go and then uh, how much is uh, in stock? How much is, on, is to be returned? Is anything lost? Uh, what is anything on layaway? what's on fulfillment, what's available, and what is in transit. By the way, our available stock is what is actually physically in stock at the store. It's not what's being ordered from the, uh, from the supplier. So once it's actually in the store, then, it's, then it becomes available. And it, does, it also does not take into account um, things like uh, what's lost or what's being returned. Uh, in transit, what's available to sell, in a specific area, when was it last modified, uh, what is your, what is the counted quantity, was it counted, which inventory cycle do, or do we use, we do do inventory cycle counting, you can do that on iVend, check your local, uh, check your integration to see whether it integrates back through to your ERP, and I'm sure that you'd know if your ERP handles integration counting, uh, handles uh, cycle counting or not. So um, I do know that we integrate into the SAP cycle counting, I'm not sure about the rest of them. Uh, next count date, uh, next count time, is, has the item been locked? Um, the, uh, this, this locked checkbox is actually quite nice because there are going to be places where certain, there are going to be certain stores where certain items are just never going to be sold. Um, uh, particularly if it's like some of these hypermarkets or um, uh, for instance, checkers, uh, uh, checkers hyper, um, to use an example, they are going to have certain items that they will sell there that will never be sold at just a normal checkers or normal shop right or whatever it might be. Um, they go, uh, your, your hypermarkets will have different items your, than your normal stores. So you can just say the items for the uh, hypermarkets, those are not locked, but for normal stores that's locked. And if those store, and, and I do see this happen, particularly with things like spa, um, if the store all of a sudden becomes big enough to handle, or to go to the next level, then you will uh, unlock that item for that store and that store can then sell it or can then have access to it. Minimum stock levels, maximum stock levels, how is it replenished, is it considered in the ERP? Um, ER, uh, is it considered in the MRP for iVent? Um, typically the MRP is referred to as forecasting in retail. It's one of the things about retail, they have a slight, they have a different, um, they've got a slightly different language. So. That's uh, that's set there. After that, there is the fulfillment warehouse. So where's it fulfilled from? What's your cost margin? What is the cost margin amount? Uh, is there a specific vendor associated with it? Uh, what is the maximum open 
price? Is it inclusively taxed? Is it tax exempt? What is in transit? Is it on hold? So there are a batch of columns over there. You do not need to see all of them. Uh, not everybody needs to see all of them. Some people only need to see some of them. If I select one with locations, you'll see that it actually goes and lists my different locations over here. So what is my available stock in what location and what can I do in each location? So you'll see I actually have 20 stocks, uh, 20 items in the frozen location. So yeah, we'll just leave it over there. Yeah, so that's over there for display purposes. Um, I've, we've discussed locations before. I'm not going to go over it again. Okay. You can also go see your product costing and how it's changed over time. Uh, if this item is serial or batch numbers, you can also drill down and see the serial and batch numbers associated with the item. Right, that gets us to the end of products. Now, I discussed product groups and product classes. We also have product categories. For you sage guys out there, I, I am aware that you've also got product uh, product classes and product categories. Uh, well, you have product categories. Um, your product categories integrate through to our product groups. Right there. This is also part of the learning the Ivan lingo that you're going to have to do. Um, so, yeah, just be aware of uh, just be aware, guys. Ivan might not necessarily integrate to where you think it integrates to. Um, we use product groups, and it's the same thing for warehouses. For um, for your sage guys, uh, your warehouses would be your locations. Uh, for everyone else, it's generally classed as a warehouse, because that's the sage way. That's the difference between well, the way most of these things are set up. Um, trust me, dealing with individual ERPs is a pain in the neck. Product categories. Back to you. Now with product categories, this is an additional grouping function that we can do, uh, that you can go put in here. And this is quite nice because with the additional function, you can actually go and um, uh, you can actually go and add in another grouping feature here. So you can really go start to get a matrix about how the items uh, uh, mix and match here. Um, I just uh, have realized that we actually have missed out some things on the actual Uh, on the item here, I forgot to go through these buttons. Surcharges! Yes, you can add a surcharge to the item. Yeah, dead easy. You put that in there and then it's, uh, so you can say you buy this item, you automatically include a certain surcharge. Um, you can also put a discount in here on the item itself. Are there specific salespersons? In some places there are only specific salespersons who can go sell this for specific stores. Uh, they might need to be qualified. Um, for, a, for a specific thing, or they might need to know certain things about it. But you can say who can sell what. Um, product attributes, we'll come back to that. That's your uh, matrix items. Uh, your merchandise, then we get across to merchandise hierarchies. And the merchandise hierarchy, I do actually have some, uh, I do actually have, there it is. I do actually have some slides about just to go and explain it. Here we are, merchandise hierarchy. Now, this is something that you will probably not, uh, that you may have encountered in your ERP setups. It's not typically something that is encountered much. The reason being is merchandise hierarchies are more retail orientated. Um, and this is where you want to really start dividing up and slicing and dicing your data for retail. Merchandise hierarchy, apparel, menswear, ladies wear, formal, casual, uh, shirts and trousers. So you can actually set a, you can set up a merchandise hierarchy in the system to go and actually, and then assign it to specific items. But you can also assign multiple merchandise hierarchies to a single item. So if you think about that, you can really start to go to town on how you go and you do your grouping of items together and what your reporting is. Now I have dealt with merchandise hierarchies before in a couple of places including there was one over here in uh, it was a camera menu it was a camera uh, retail, camera distributor out here they also did memory cards and they also did um, uh, what else did they do uh, they also did like the, uh, the the cases for cell phones a body glove um, 
uh, yeah, they did Body Glove and SanDisk. I think they were local uh, distributors for SanDisk memory sticks. And considering that every every cell phone out there probably comes from the manufacturer with a SanDisk memory stick in it, yeah, that's a that's a lot of memory sticks. But the advantage of this is, uh, with this, you can actually go and they can really slice and dice the data. They can see what is selling, what is not selling, how it is selling, what it is selling to, where it is coming from, all the rest of it. You can go put that over here and you can set that up. And that looks something like this in iVend. So you could define multiple merchandise hierarchies and you can put more than one to your products. The advantage of that is, is that if I have an item, I can come over here to merchandise hierarchy and I can assign it to one merchandise hierarchy. I can then maybe add in another merchandise hierarchy, call it uh, summer fashion, call it fashion, uh, or fashion 2019, and then I can break that up into summer, winter, autumn, spring, which are your traditional sort of fashion type uh, breakdowns, and I can say exactly, and I can also assign it to there. So now I can see what formal tops were sold in summer 20, uh, for the summer 2019 uh, lineup were sold in a specific period of time. Was it actually sold in summer? Was it sold after summer? Was it sold in spring? These are the kind of things that, trust me, the the fashion industry in particular goes nuts for because they need a proper breakdown of all of their reporting for this. Um, and then finally, product cost, which uh, we've discovered, which we've discussed earlier. Now, I did also say that we would have a look at a uh, we would have a look across at the um, uh, at these ones over here, the Apex Barnick jacket. Uh, we did have a quick look across at them on the retail on the retail side, on the point of sale side. But you'll see over here, these are the matrix items with your matrix item and is it a child matrix item or not. Um, this over here is the style. And then if I come over here, I can also go and view the child inventory. So uh, the entire idea being that when you create a matrix item, it will you go and you say, yes, it's a matrix item. And uh, it, you create the initial style. It's an Apex Bionic jacket. I then go to my product attributes and I go to say it's going to be in uh, brown and black and it's going to have certain sizes that are associated with it. I then go create and it will then go and create um, these individual items in the system and I can then see how much there is actually there for them. And then from there it actually goes and creates them in the system. So I drill down into this. Apex Bionic Jacket, and you'll see it's marked as a matrix child item, um, and that's the way that you will actually keep stock of this specific item in the system. All right. Uh, beyond there, we also have units of measure, right, which is a basic label. Then you've got your units of measure group. The entire idea with this is you then go and associate each unit of measure with a specific amount. So you label one your first one is always going to be your uh, one is to one, just to go and establish a baseline. Then you go say one pair is equal to two eaches in this case, or two units. Dozen, box, carton, case. Yeah, I think you can see how those go fit together. Okay. Merchandise hierarchy. Well, this is where you actually set it up. You'll see over here if I open the, well, this is the footwear one. Let me go and rather open the apparel one. And you can see the different apparel uh, things about how they're going to fit together here. You can go add in more. You can adjust them. You can get out to about 15 levels. Having said that, please do not aim for 15 levels. It's, yeah, there are, I'm sure you guys have this in, in all your systems. I know in SAP there's a thing called segments, and the entire idea with that is to not aim for, 50, aim for nine segments of a chart of accounts. It's that way lies madness and people just end up going and adding in general stuff just to go pad it out and it, it just really doesn't work. Normally I've very rarely seen one go past seven um, to be very honest. Uh, so 15 is not, a t is not a target. Uh, product attributes, I talked briefly about these. These are things like your colors. So color, you're going to set up your different colors and then also your sizes.
barcode masks. Uh, this over here is something that you may or may not end up dealing with. Uh, typically, you see this, I see this with the fresh fruit and veg sections in stores. So you go, you get your fresh fruit and veg, you take it along to the guy with the scale, he weighs it, and then he prints you out a, uh, he prints you out a sticker that he slaps on the side of the fruit or on the side of the cellophane bag. And then you go and you take it, and at the till they scan the bag. They scan, well, they don't scan the bag, they, they scan the sticker. And the system picks up and goes and says, oh, you've bought this for this price at this quantity. That's the way that this works. Um, that's a barcode mask, also known as a split barcode. There's another way, there's another one is called. Um, you've got two options here. One is a fixed length. This one I said is 14. And you can go say it's got a six things of a product ID in it. It's got a price, and a price has got uh, cents. So that's why it's got a factor of 100. So because your price would actually have uh, rands and cents into it. And then also your quantity. You can put your quantity over there for that specific item. Uh, and your quantity would obviously be in values of a, of a thousand because it's kgs. So that's how it determines how much it does. Uh, at the same time, you can also do one that's called a del delimited one, which works in much the same way. It's just the delimited one is not set to a specific length. It will it can expand and shrink as it needs to. Uh, packaging, packaging groups, we've discussed those. Alternate products, uh, yeah, we've discussed those as well. Uh, alternate UPC codes, we've discussed those as well. Uh, upselling products, discussed deleting upselling products. Yeah, we've, well, you can delete upsell products because after a while you might want to, you might want to change what's being upsold or you might no longer do upsells for that specific product. Uh, kit setups, uh, we talked briefly about that and I did show you that. Uh, assembly details, we've discussed something similar for it. Uh, dynamic assembly we have discussed, manufacturer we've discussed, shipping types. So you see we're actually getting pretty far along on this. Uh, shipping types, is it available in store, does it does have a web page. We do not integrate through to like FedEx or UPS or any of the shipping companies really because most countries have got their own local little shipping com uh, company that they use. I mean FedEx is great in the US but you know it's used in like US and UK and there's DHL that's also used all over the place. Right, uh, Aramex uh, or your uh, Ram vans or whatever else the case might be, those are generally not you. Those are generally local to like South Africa. They're generally not used overseas, and they don't have places overseas where they're used. So that's uh, that's a bit of an issue. There is no real worldwide one shipping company that's used everywhere. Well. Uber might be getting there one day, but it's not there at the moment. Okay. Then we get down to things like fulfillment plans. Now, to explain this, and I did say I would come back to this when we were go when we were looking at it in the in the store setup. The fulfillment plan over here. The entire idea with this fulfillment plan is you are going to be to go and uh, if you're going to go and deliver an item to a specific person. So let's say I bought, I did an order for the item. The person went and said, no, no, I do actually want a, I want this delivered to me. And they would then go and have it delivered. Uh, the, you can actually have it delivered to them. Um, when they order the item, you can then say, do you require an address? Uh, how do you uh, allocate the inventory? Is it allocated either on uh, purchase? Or is it, is it allocated on sale or is it allocated on delivery? So does it go out of the door when you sell, when you do an invoice for the item or does it go out of the door when you do a, uh, a sale for the item? Then there's a subsidiary and do you reserve the quantity for special orders or not? Um, that's quite important because what can happen is people say, oh yes, well, uh, something comes in and then it doesn't reserve enough of the item to actually use the... Um, it doesn't reserve enough the item to actually give up for the special orders for the people who've, who've, uh, who've ordered it. And then you end up, oh, yes, we've sold everything. And the guy comes in, yeah, I had a special order for this item, man. Uh, uh, I'm here to pick it up. And you're like, uh, yeah, that's, that, that's not going to work. Okay, yeah, we, we may have made a mistake over there on that one. 
So for us, you can actually go say, no, there are certain quantities that are reserved for special orders. Uh, is there a surcharge associated with it? And must they pay in advance? So that's there. That determines how exactly stock moves for deliveries. But with that, we also handle layaways. Um, I know I did discuss layaways earlier. That's your 10% uh, down and 12 months to pay kind of, uh, kind of thing. And you can see over here, yep, 10% down, 12 months to pay. You can go say with this, okay, I'd like to buy that couch. Okay, 10% now, 12 months to pay. That means that every month I have to come back in and do a payment for X number of uh, rands or bob or dollars or whatever it might be. Um, you can go put that, uh, or you can put that here and you can say what the minimum installment count is. So, because some people might say, yeah, I don't actually want to pay over 12 months. I just want to pay over like three months. You know, I don't have the money immediately, but I'll, you know, I can pay you over three months. Um, same thing for maximum installment counts, same thing for duration type. Uh, for your duration type, and you can say, is is this a weekly payment? Is it a monthly payment, quarterly payment, half year payment, and yearly payments? Or does it have a specific duration you want to put in? Uh, installment duration, when is your first installment due? Uh, what is your, uh, when does it allocate the inventory? So does it allocate it immediately on sale? Um, or does it, uh, allocate, does it actually remove the inventory from your stock when you do a delivery? What is your deposit type? What is your deposit percentage? Uh, delivery after receiving a certain percentage of payment and what's the subsidiary? Once again, you can also add in surcharges because there are certain countries where you do need to go and put in a surcharge, for instance, a handling fee. Or it could be a case of if the guy goes and ref uh, asks for a refund on his layaway, um, you then have got the right to go charge a 1% money handling fee in South Africa, which you can put in here to automate it. And after that, item printing, which is kind of similar to customer printing, which I spoke about earlier. Now, item printing over here, you can actually go put in a specific, uh, this over here, you can say it goes for a specific product or a specific product group. And you can put it in for, say, electronics. And let's go do that. And I think I've got an electronics. There we go, an electronics. And you can go, say, um, warranty void against uh, against lightning strikes for instance okay so if you get struck by lightning and it's your electronic device then yeah you do sorry no refunds um, and you can put that in caution uh, knife shop if you buy if it's if it's a knife um, you know caution chemicals my chemicals harmful for human skin if it's uh, some of these uh, cleaning chemicals or pesticides or whatever it might be you can put that on there. Inventory cycles, yeah, I discussed that we have the we do have them in. You can set up your cycle, when's the counting date, count time, count place, and also your inventory revaluation. So because obviously if it's a standalone system, you are going to need to revalue your stock from time to time. Uh, if it's not a standalone system, then you are not going to need to do that. So uh, if it's an integrated system, then the ERP will handle this, but you will need to revalue your inventory from time to time, specifically for things like moving average. Okay. Then we finally get down to product list. Now, product list is pretty cool because what it actually does is it basically puts all your products and pretty much most of the features I've just shown you, it puts them into a grid. Actually, we'll see in a second as soon as it loads up. There we go. It's now loaded it up. And I can go see, and I can quite literally go and update and adjust uh, whatever I want on the products directly here from the grid. So. There. Yeah, I can also see things like if it's got child items, what's the inventory view on it? Um, it, does it have upsells associated with it? Uh, is there any alternate products associated with it? And what is the matrix view associated with it? So that's pretty cool. Okay, so now we finished that. I just quickly want to go through, okay, we've finished inventory, we've finished business partners. Um, we need to quickly go through, uh, let's see, pricing, uh, pricing and promotions and gift certificates. 
Um, if we could finish those, well, if we even get a chance at business transactions, um, that would be pretty cool. In fact, how much? Business transactions we can uh, business transactions we'll do today, and then we'll go back for and then we'll see how far we get with pricing and promotions. So business transactions, guys, if you're familiar with ERPs, you know about business transactions. It's a good receipt. You know we are receiving goods into the system. Um, right. So that gets receipted in. You can go put even put against business partners, times, dates. Uh, we do have an import file where you can actually import from a uh, from a CSV file into the system. That will go pop it in, then we can go get that uh, in ready and uh, in and done. Uh, are there specific reference numbers for it? Uh, what's the reason? Uh, are there reason codes? What's the events? Uh, what is your business partner type? If there is a business partner type, you're doing a good receipt for prices, comments, and is this an adjustment entry, which is typically from your inventory counting. You add your products, put them in, put in your quantity, put in your price, receipt it in, done. Uh, and then afterwards, you can even print labels from here if you want for your specific items. Uh, purchase order, and you'll see that most of the screens work in a similar way. Similar thing for purchase orders. I pull out who my vendor is, purchase order reference, delivery dates, status, subtotals, updates. If you Once again, if you've done purchase orders before, and pretty much most people have, then this is not going to have any real surprises for you. Um, you can do the import file again. You can go and also put in things like reason codes and comments if you want. Um, if you do want to have this uh, approved, you can also have it set that you can set up an approval over here for it. Um, I'd suggest having a look at the video online for that. Yeah, reason code comments, and there's your, you load that up. Once that's in, uh, you can then, uh, once that's in, that can integrate across to your ERP. It depends on which ERP you're using. Please check what your, once again, what your local listings are for your uh, integration. Uh, after that, once you've done your purchase order, you then do your goods receipt of the purchase order, which is basically copying the purchase order to your goods receipt, checking what's ordered, what's been received, and once again, you can import a CSV file to go say what is received here, and then you can also go and put in your reason content, your reason and comment codes, print labels, and receive that into the system. This is as far as IVED actually goes on the purchasing side of things because after this, if there's an invoice from the supplier, that will get loaded into the ERP from our perspective. We do also do a goods return where you can do a return against specific, uh, you can do a return to a specific vendor uh, against certain uh, goods receipt POs that you can do, but we don't really handle the credit, we won't handle the credit note for that either that uh, the supply credit note, the supply credit note would be handled in the accounting system. Uh, all right, at the same time, we also do goods issues. I am coming back to the stock transfers and their requests in a second. Um, goods issues, yeah, you saw the goods receipt, the goods issue works the same way, it just takes stock out. Then we've got the stock transfers and stock requests and stock transfer shipments and receipts. Now. I'm going to show you what a request looks like because you do need to go see what's there. So which warehouse you are at, so the, which warehouse you're requesting, from, you're requesting and which warehouse you are requesting from, what's the business date, due date, request number, those can, your request number can be automated, um, status, acceptance, comments, reason code, and then also add in your products. Uh, I do actually need to go, let's actually just put in, there you go, general warehouse and 12 there you go add products on the add product screen I, as soon as it loads up i can actually go and use some neat little features such as i can hold the control button or i can also hold the shift button there we go and that'll all be added into the that'll all be added in over here uh, open quantity, accept quantity, reason, sender, and then we get uh, sender reason codes, sender comments, receiver uh, reason codes, receiver comments. Now, this over here goes and um, how exactly this works is something I need to explain to you over here because unfortunately, in order to do a full good, in order to do a full stock transfer cycle, and we did do it on video online, once again, please go check. Um, we have done it online, 
and you can go see exactly how it works there. But to just uh, talk you through what happens is, first off, I would do, a, first off, store two over here. Let's say it requests, um, uh, let's say it's about to sell out, out of iPhones or, um, I don't know, Playstations or something like that. Let's go with iPhones. I can, as store two, I can go and have a look and see, hey, store one has got 50 iPhones. It's not, it's not going to need all those iPhones. Uh, I can send a request from store two to store one for say, uh, yes, please send me 20 iPhones. Um, and that's the stock transfer request that you just saw. That'll go over here to store one. Store one will then respond with what we call a stock transfer request received transaction, which looks exactly like the stock transfer request transaction. Except the only differences over here is what will happen is the person of store one will say, oh, you want 20 iPhones. Yeah, but the reason I've still got so many iPhones is I've still, as I know that my heavy shop, that uh, people are coming in later to go buy those. I can't give you 20, I can give you 10. So he can do the stock transfer request receipt over here. When he does that, he says, no, I can't give you all of that, I can give you 10. That then goes back, uh, that will then inform the person at store two that he's only going to get 10 iPhones, he's not going to get 20. Fine. Then what happens, store one will convert the stock transfer request received into a stock transfer shipment. The stock will then come out of store one, it goes into the cloud of, uh, cloud of, trans of the goods and transit warehouse, and then store two will do a goods receipt. For the uh, for the actual items being receipted into the uh, for the items actually uh, when they come into uh, store two here, so that is the entire stock transfer process talked through. I would recommend going online and having a look at the uh, at the actual videos for that. They are actually yeah we it took us it took us a fair bit of time to do it, but we got it up and we did it and it, it worked. Yeah. Uh, kit build break, um, this is where you can basically just say, I want to go and build this item. So I want to build 10 of these. Congratulations, I've now built 10, 10 of these. This might end up doing a, pro a production transaction in your ERP, depending on what your ERP is. Uh, inventory counting, yeah, this is inventory counting. You, new, you create an inventory count ID. Uh, then you go say which products you're going to count, and you can also say which location you're going to count. So I'm doing this. You'll see it's limited to a specific store because typically these would be generated at the store. Um, you don't, with IVED, you don't really enforce the enforce it from head office to the store. Okay, uh, or add products, or just straightforward add products search. And yeah, I think my, oh dear, I've done something that's, uh, yeah, I've done something that my machine has not liked. So anyway, you would be able to go search, add the actual, um, add the actual items in and then do an inventory count. It's relatively straightforward. It's like an inventory count. I'm sure you guys are familiar with them. Okay. Well, while that's going and sorting itself out, let's just open up management console again. In this case, I can do it because I actually have more licenses for Management Console. Oh, there we go. The other one's shut down. So, yeah, sorry about that, guys. I have actually done some things in the background to my Management Console that are not really that great, which is probably why I, uh, probably why this happens. It's all in the pursuit of going and fixing those things that uh, those weird things that my partners bring to me. So, unfortunately, that does sometimes mean that my Management Console does break. Again. That warning message was just to go say um, that it, I didn't log out correctly on the previous transaction. So over here, inventory counting that we were talking about, uh, here's one I did earlier, like they say, it will bring up the list of items, 
You can then go and do things like show install quantity, show difference. Some places want you to see that. Some places do not want to do that. Then you can or you can also import a CSV file in to go say what's uh, what has been counted. Um, and then once you've done that, you can reconcile inventory and be on your way. Okay, after that, uh, expenses. I did talk about this earlier. This is, uh, or at least I did mention this in the point of sale side because this is something you can do over here on the point of sale expense. But this user does not have the rights to do that. So over here, I can actually do one where I go and I say I need 50 bucks for thermal paper for, for the tills, for till paper. Um, I can load that in. Typically that is translated across to the, um, uh, that is translated across to the ERP in various ways. It's either going to be a journal entry. I think in some cases it might actually be a service, um, a, a service invoice. Or at least that's the way SAP handles it. Uh, if, if it's Sage, I do know it does handle it, but it just maybe in a slightly different way. Um, after that, well, we'll come. Okay, we've got planning scenarios. Mobile POS will handle when we do mobile POS tomorrow and location transfers. Location transfers, this is your, uh, this is if you're moving from uh, items from one location to another. Now, I've talked about locations before. Uh, typically, them being the, uh, uh, being like the butchery, bakery, uh, fresh fruit and veg section, those kind of things. You can see my setup that I have here. Um, with this, I can choose that if I want to go and move certain items across. Just select that. And I can go say which locations it's moving from, which locations it's moving to. I'm going to move across 20. I can put in a reason code as well. And then I click OK. All right. And that will go and move that across. And it will also print me, print me out a... Uh, print me out a slip for it. Uh, report. There you go. There. So that more or less. Okay. So we've got a last little bit of time, which will just allow me to go through the um, the forecasting and planning. Yeah, that should finish us up. Okay. So let's go to plan. Let's go to forecasting. Oh no, wait. Forecast planning. That's the one. Now, forecast plan over here is something that you can go set up in the system um, to go say what is exactly is it based on, which historical sales year you're looking at, which year you're forecasting to. Yes, I know my one is 2011, the other one is 2014, and we're very much nowhere near those, but those are the years I've got data in the system for, so yeah. After that, you can say what is it based on? Is it based on a product, product category, product group, and merchandise hierarchy, like I mentioned earlier. So in this case, I'll leave it as product. Which specific products you're doing? I'm leaving it blank, so all products in this case. And then consider refunds in the forecast or not, and which warehouses am I looking at? Once I've set that up, I can then go across to my forecast. From my forecast, I can then choose choose my planning scenario and that will go and give me my breakdown of my uh, of what it expects me to go and have to go and uh, buy or sell in which specific place um, as you can see I can actually go and select this across two specific uh, regions or what is selling what's where there we go that's a particularly interesting one um, historical sales there's my forecasted data on my different items um, I can actually export the data and I can re-import it back in again. So I can choose and chop and change it. This forecasting may not be available with some integrations. Um, I know it's not available with the SAP Business One integration. I believe it is available with Sage ones. So it depends. You can also adjust your forecasting sub-methods. Once again, there's a video on this. I'm not going to go too much further into it um, because we are almost out of time. And... The last thing I wanted to get to is, pla well, planning scenario, and then I was also hoping to do a little bit of pricing, but we'll, yeah, we can do some pricing. After you've done your forecasting, you can then come and do your planning scenario. So what exactly are you going to, uh, this would be your MRP side. Uh, what are you considering? Your refund locations, storage locations, uh, what time ranges, uh, planning horizons, historical data, all the rest of it. You can then go click run. And it will generate your recommendation on what you should purchase to go make sure that all of your stores are up 
ready and running and have all the stock they need. Finally, because I am actually running out of words, uh, we are just going to have a quick look at, uh, at price list and at least we are getting, yeah, I want to leave bonus buys for tomorrow, but pricing and special price list and special price list we can do today, um, then we are at least mostly caught up. So price list over here, let's have a look. Price list is a price list. You, before I even get into that, you can have as many price lists as you want. We can open up. And in here, you go and you find that we've got all of our product codes. Um, you can, if you want to, actually search by uh, search uh, in this top bar over here if you really, if you want to. If I press the little plus button and I've got different units of measures, I can put you at different prices to different units of measures. Yes, you can import into this. Yes, there is a specific currency that's applicable to this. Um, yeah, it's what can I say? It's a price list. A price list is a price list unless it isn't a price list because it's been complicated. After that, we have the special price list. Now, the special price list I can assign to one of two, I can do in one of two ways. In SAP, it's known as your period and volume discounts. Um, for us, it's just known as special price list. Um, I can assign it either to a customer, so Paul, Donald, or Kenneth. Let's go with Donald. I go edit. Donald pops up, and is he, acti uh, is he active? Is there a specific date range that it's active to? Um, and do they have anything that falls under this? Mm, I can then choose to do things like adding a date. So a date horizon for the specific date, and then I could also go and say a specific quantity. So if he buys within a specific date, uh, and he buys a certain unit of measure for the specific time, he will then get that discount percentage which is kind of nice, but that only works for him. What about if I want to go and do it for everyone? I can go edit, and this one I'm doing on the store, and this one is based on the price list. So this is actually going to be based for everyone. I can then do price lists. I can then um, go and say, okay, if I buy something at this date for this time, if somebody buys some, uh, for instance, 15 of these uh, between this period and that period, they will then get that specific discount associated with them. Okay. There are many things that you can go set up over here. There are plenty of things you can go set up over here. Our pricing is really quite, uh, yeah, it is comprehensive for this. Tomorrow we will pick up on bonus buys and we will continue through. Um, we've still got uh, promotions, gift certificates, uh, loyalty end of day until management but those are pretty much the only things that are really left and maybe some things on reports and that's it so we are more or less on time to finish at the end of the week thank you very uh, guys if there are any questions speak now or forever hold your peace or otherwise just don't I'm, I don't mind right so There we go. Kwaku uh, goes and says, please, if a create if you created a custom defined field, how should I ensure that I search inside that field whenever I type at the home page of the pause? Okay, just to be very clear about this. Um you're talking about this field over here, right, the the search bar, because the search bar itself, uh, you can't actually change how that searches. Um, it searches within its specified fields within the, it, that we have set up. Um, in fact, if I go across to Management Console, Control F1, uh, let's just open this up. I know it is over here is... A barcode, scan, a barcode resolution order. Um, this is the basic. There are some others that have been added. Um, I think the uh, phone numbers in here is, uh, should be added as well. But these are the basics. This is what it is. You cannot force it to go scan within a custom defined field. Um, it won't do that. It, it doesn't do that at all. Um, and we look, don't get me wrong, I'd love for it to do that. But my biggest problem, well, our biggest problem is that it's um, <laughs> the 
specific search that happens over here at the POS, it, because it's running on very low powered machines, it means that um, they can sometimes struggle if you've got a really big search or if it returns too much data. So we try not to do that. Um, and it's also a very, 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 um, it's a very, very complex set of, uh, a very, very complex query is actually running behind there. I would have loved to be, um, trust me, it has been one of our, requ our requested items. Can we please have a different way to go and search within this? Or can we add or can we adjust the search? And it's come back no. So yeah, that's the, that's the basic, uh, that's the basic reply there. Um, we are looking at other ways of doing it. There are things that are going into the background that we're working on, but for the moment, no. Sorry to say that. All right. Okay. Uh, any other questions? No other questions. Okay, uh, guys. It uh, okay, guys. It's twelve o'clock my time, which means lunch. So I am going to uh, call into this, and I will see you tomorrow, same bat time, same bat channel. And we will go and continue the, um, we'll continue with this, and we will finish up with iVent then, and I will see what happens. If you guys do want to go do a session where we write the exam, we can do that, we can have a look at that next week, but I do, I'm going to need to get some form of consensus or uh, somebody just ask for that uh, formally, and we can see what we do there. All right, thank you so much guys, I will chat soon, and uh, have a good day. Bye.